So a while back, in Chemistry 2, I talked about an Indo-European language I hadn't heard of until I was researching for this channel. The Tocharians. The Tocharians lived in western China between about 400 to 800 AD, and their culture and language, or, and what little we know about it, is very interesting. Most of what we know comes from Chinese and Buddhist records, and a small paper trail that they left behind. However, their language is, like, very decodable, because it's written in a script that we already know, um, the same script as Sanskrit. So, it means that we have a very useful opportunity to explore a culture that was, as you'll see, very isolated. This isolation starts with when they separated from Proto-Indo-European. About 3000 BC, a group of people that we now call the Afanasivo moved from the origin of Proto-Indo-European, around Russia-Ukraine area, over to Siberia. They brought agriculture to this area, and they didn't have any writings, and honestly, they didn't have very much at all. But we can tell from DNA testing that they're definitely related to other Indo-European groups that are in between there and Russia. It's believed that from this old and early separated group, the Tocharians came. So to, to um, further emphasize why that's cool is, one, it means they're not Indo-Aryan. Unlike every other Asian and Central Asian Indo-European language that's there, most of them are related except for the Tocharians. We know that from their language and most likely from this probable history of the people, that they're not Indo-Aryan, which is cool. Because if they have a word that's a cognate with another word in the European language, it better points to those words definitely were in Proto-Indo-European, because that's the last time that they were together, or together as part of the family. Moving on to the Tocharians themselves. About 200 AD, there were people who were called the Cushions, they spoke a Indo-Aryan language, and they brought with them the Brahmin script, which is what um, uh, Sanskrit's written with. They brought Buddhism, and they brought their art style, they brought more agriculture, and this is the um, culture that's most reflected in Tocharian culture. Every writing that we have in, Tocha in a Tocharian language, because there's actually two, maybe three, that'll be later. Every writing that we have in a Tocharian language is a Buddhist script, except for one, and we'll talk about that later. What's cool about this writing system is, and I'm going to make a, a video about the, the history of writing and go through that, but um, just to hype it up even more, even this Sanskrit script, script is related to Phoenician in a roundabout way. So, everything you think you know about how writing systems have developed in the world is probably wrong. Okay, so like I said before, there's two Tocharian languages that we know of. There's cleverly named Tocharian A and Tocharian B. There might be a Tocharian C, but that's not very important right now. Focus on A and B. Those are the big boys. In Tocharian A, Everything that we have is in Buddhist. In Tocharian B, almost everything that we have is in Buddhist except for one love poem. Now, that led researchers to think, okay, Tocharian A is like Latin. It's a language of religion, and the people might not have spoken it very much, and it maybe wasn't understood by the people themselves, and it's... If that's equivocable to Latin, then Tocharian B must be equivocable to French or Spanish, right? It's a more 
everyday man's language. It's a little newer, maybe, and more people would have understood it. And they base that assumption all on these the the nature of these texts. However, when they started digging into the words and the languages themselves and how they related to Proto-Indo-European, they found that Tocharian A was more different from Proto-Indo-European. It had more mutations, whereas Tocharian B was a lot more conservative in relation to Proto-Indo-European. So that kind of messes up our Latin-French analogy, and what it means is most likely these two languages, which were not mutually intelligible. It's not like someone could go speak to Carrion A and then talk to someone who spoke to Carrion B and understand it. These languages have very different um, changes to the words. <clears throat> they either, they were just spoken in two different places that were too far apart, or they were spoken at two different times, at which point to carry and be would have been old. Okay, now let's talk about the to carry in words that sound a lot like English that we know of to prove that it's Indo-European. Because if there is a word that is similar to English in to carry in, then that means that it's definitely from Proto-Indo-European. The word for three is try. The word for six is skas. The word for eight is oct. The word for nine is new. The word for hundred is kanta. Now remember that um, K sound to an H happened in um, Germanic. So the fact that this has a K means it's even closer to Proto-Indo-European. The word for father is Fasser. The word for mother is Maser. The word for brother is Prosser. The word for sister is Ser, which is practically identical to the French word for sister, Sur. The word for cow is Ku. The word for milk is Malkant, or to milk something. It's a, that's a noun. So keep in mind that I cherry pick those a little bit. There are lots of words in Tocharian that don't sound like English, but they might sound like another Indo-European language. Now, unfortunately, and obviously, the Tocharians are no more. There's a lot of reasons for this. Um, a lot of their history is marred by being invaded by China and then being invaded by another Turkic group and then being reinvaded by China and then being invaded by the Tibetans. And so because they were Buddhist, the Chinese treated them fairly well and they spoke fairly highly of them in their, um, in their own writings, which is why we know much about their culture beyond the fact that they were Buddhist. But by 800 AD, they were all but gone. What had happened was a Turkic group called the Uyghurs, the one that are being oppressed by the Chinese government right now, um, they moved into that area and their language slowly became the language of the common people. What's interesting though is that the fact that the Tocharians were Buddhist didn't die immediately. The Uyghurs were Manichaean, which is an interesting religion. It's the only global religion to have died, so look that up. It's really fun. Um, anyway, they abandoned their Manichaeism in favor of the Buddhism. So I think that's pretty pretty interesting, pretty telling, that like even though their language passed away, their concept of religion kept going. In conclusion... The Tocharians were interesting. They were a little isolated into a European group on the oases of the Silk Road. And while they may not have played an entirely huge role in history, their role in language has been fun. Thank you for watching Linking. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and have a great day. Bye-bye.